Hello, in the last video we had looked at IPCs or inter process communication. So, we had seen that due to IPCs we could build application comprising of several processes and uh, we could achieve modularity and as a result of having modular uh, processes with each process doing a specific uh, job, we are able to have a very efficient and uh, easily easy to understand applications. One consequence of having this modular approach and the use of IPCs is the requirement for synchronization. In this video, we will look at what synchronization is and what are the issues corresponding to synchronization and how it can be solved. Let us explain what synchronization is with this motivating scenario. Let us say we have two programs, program 0 and program 1 and a shared variable which is uh, defined as counter. So, uh, it is a global shared variable int counter equal to 5. So, in program 0 we are incrementing the counter by 1 while in program 1 we are reducing the counter by 1 essentially decreasing the counter by 1. Now, as we know that when we execute this program let us say in a single core processor. So, program 0 would execute for some time then there would be a context switch then program 2 would ex execute and then program 1 would execute and so on assuming that it is a round robin scheduling and assuming that no other process is present. Now, the question is what would be the value of counter? One would expect that the counter value is 5 because uh, let us say program 0 executes first. So, it is going to increment the value of counter. So, counter becomes 6 over here and then program 1 executes and it decrements the value of the counter and since the uh, counter is shared so the, and the, has the value of 6 it gets decremented back to 5. On the other hand if let us say program 1 executes first and then program 0. So, counter minus minus would cause the counter to reduce from 5 to 4 and then program 0 executes this particular line causing it to increment the counter from 4 back to 5. Thus, one would expect that the result at the end of both these programs would be 5 for the value of the counter. But now what we will show is that we can also obtain the values of 4 and 6 for the value of counter. So, let us see this more in detail. So, let us look more deeply into how these instructions are executing. Let us see what happens when we are actually incrementing this counter. So, essentially what we are doing is we are seeing how what happens when we are doing counter plus plus with respect to the assembly instructions. So, first the value of counter which is stored in memory is loaded into a register say R 1 and then R 1 is incremented by 1. So, that is the second line R 1 equal to R 1 plus 1 and then R 1 is written back into memory. So, R 1 is written back into the value of counter which is stored in memory. So, in terms of the numbers. So, we have 5 here which is the counter. So, the contents of counter is 5 and that is loaded into R 1. Then 5 is incremented. So, now R 1 contains 6 and the value of R 1 is written back into counter. So, this value of 6 is written back into the memory location specified by counter and therefore, 6 is written back in the counter. Now, suppose there is a context switch the same thing happens again. So, value of counter is, is loaded into R 2. So, the R 2 has a value of 6, then we are decrementing R 2 by 1. So, R 2 becomes 6 minus 1 that is 5 and then the register R 2 is stored back into the memory location counter. Therefore, R 2 is 5, so therefore the value of 5 is stored back into the counter. So, at the end of these two programs executing the value of counter is 5. So, now let us look at the second two scenarios when we get the value of counter as 4 and when we get the value of counter as 6. So, let us look at this scenario. So, program 0 executes and loads the value of counter into R 1. Therefore, recollect that R 1 has the value of 5. Now, there is a context switch over here and process 1 
executes. Now the counter over here is still having the value of 5 and it is loaded into the register R2. Then R2 is decremented by 1, so R2 now has 4 and the value of 4 is stored back into counter. So now counter in memory has the value of 4. Now there is a context switch again and recollect when there is a context switch the program 0 continues from wherever it had stopped. Essentially the context which was stored in the kernel is restored back into process 0 allowing it to continue from where it stopped. Therefore, we see that the value of R1 at this particular point was 5 and after the context switch we have R1 back at 5 again over here. So, R1 is incremented by 1 to get 6 and the value of 6 is stored into counter. Therefore, at the end of this execution we get the counter value equal to 6. Now, let us look at the third case that is when we get the counter value equal to 4. So, this is exactly the opposite to the second case in which the program 1 is executed first. So, essentially the counter which has a value of 5 gets loaded into R2, therefore R2 has 5. Now there is a context switch causing program 0 to execute and uh, the value of counter is loaded into R2 incremented by 1, so that is 6. and 6 is written back into the into counter. So, counter now will have the value of 6. So, there is a context which again causing program 1 to execute from where it had stopped. So, we notice that R2 had the value of 5. Now, R2 is reduced by 1. So, that is that makes it 4 and the value of 4 is stored into the memory location corresponding to counter. Thus, at the end of execution in this case the value of counter is 4. So, this was an example of the issues that could occur when we have a shared memory. So, even though there was a very simple operation of incrementing a counter in one place while decrementing the counter in another place, we had seen that the result could be different depending on how the instructions get executed and how the context which is occurred. So, we would define this scenario more formally by what is known as race conditions. A race condition is a situation where several processes access and manipulate the same data. So, this part of the process which accesses the common or the shared data is known as a critical section. The outcome of a race condition would depend on the order in which the accesses to that data take place. As we have seen in the previous example, depending on which program executes first as well as depending on how the context switches occur, the result would vary. The race conditions uh, could be prevented by uh, what is known as synchronization. Essentially with synchronization we would ensure that only one process at a time would manipulate the critical data. So, uh, coming back to our example, what is required is that we would mark this area of instructions which access or which manipulate the shared data as a critical section. Then we would have some additional techniques to ensure that no more than one process could execute in a critical section at a given time. So, we will see this in more detail in this particular video along with uh, follow, uh, the videos that follow this. Race conditions not only occur in single core systems, but also in multi core systems. So, essentially this is quite obvious to deduce that due to the fact that each processor in a multi core system is executing simultaneously, it is likely that this shared variable could be accessed by both programs at exactly the same time. Therefore, race conditions in multi core systems is more pronounced compared to the single core systems. Now, let us look at how solutions for the critical section problem can be obtained. Any solution for the critical section problem should satisfy the following requirements. These are 1 mutual exclusion, 2 progress and 3 no starvation or bounded weight. In mutual exclusion, the critical section solution should ensure that not more than one process is in the critical section at a given time. Progress should ensure that 
when no process is in the critical section, any process that requests entry into that critical section must be permitted without any delay. Bounded weight or no starvation means that there is an upper bound on the number of times a process enters the critical section while an other is waiting. Essentially, it means that a process should not wait infinitely long in order to gain access into the critical section. All critical section problems use techniques known as locking and unlocking in order to solve the critical section problem. Essentially, in the solution, we would have something like this, which is also a shared variable. So, we define something known as a lock and uh, define it as an L. So, before entering into the critical section, the program should invoke lock L and while exiting from the critical section, the unlock L should be invoked. Similarly, every program which uses the same critical section should lock and unlock before entering and exiting the critical section respectively. Now, what lock does is that it acquires the lock L exclusively. So, after lock completes its execution, that is after the function lock L completes execution, it is ensured that exactly one process, or in this case only this process enters into the critical section and is present in the critical section. When unlock is invoked, the exclusive access to the lock is released. This permits other processes to access the critical section. Now, the locking and unlocking should be designed in such a way that the three requirements of the sol critical section solution should be satisfied. That is mutual exclusion, progress and bounded weight. So, we had already seen mutual exclusion and uh, let us see progress. So, progress means that let us say program 0 is not in the critical section and let us say program 1 has come here and it has requested the lock. So, progress means that since no other program is in the critical section. So, it should be given the lock immediately. So, program 1 should get exclusive access to the lock. Bounded weight means this particular scenario. Let us say program 0 is present in the critical section while program 1 has requested the lock. So, there is a limit on the amount of time that program 1 has to wait before it gets access into the critical section. That is the solution should ensure that program 0 unlocks L and only then will program 1 enter into the lock. So, there is a bound on the amount of time that program 1 waits if it requests the lock while program 0 is already in the critical section. The use of lock and unlock constructs in a program will ensure that the critical section is atomic. So, when do we need to use these locking mechanisms? Essentially, single instructions by themselves are atomic. Instructions such as add EAX to EBX is an atomic instruction and does not require any explicit locking. However, multiple instructions where you have a sequence of instructions and if you need to make them atomic, then explicit locking and unlocking is required. So, each piece of code in the operating system must be checked if they need to be made atomic or not. Essentially, things involving the interrupt handlers need to be checked to be made atomic. So, in this particular video, we had seen the requirement for locking and unlocking of instructions. So, in the next video, we are going to see how such locking and unlocking mechanisms are implemented in systems. Thank you.